there, I'm Black Bright, broadcasting out of the UK into your homes. Welcome to my channel. First time you're passing through, like, subscribe, share. Um, and yeah, you can interact with my subscribers. And I wanted to talk about the 12 point system today because you're going to be hearing a lot about it over the next few months. So I'm going to have to read most of it because it's not an area I'm feeling familiar with. And I thought that because I'm not familiar with it, you know, I try to make it easier for you to be familiar with it. You know, I always feel that these kind of things are important. You hear it banded around 12 point system, 12 point system. A lot of people, um, unless you're really going to start reading up on it, you're not going to really be acquainted with it. So I thought I'd share that with you. Hope you don't mind. And yeah, so what would the global Britain and an Australian point based system mean for the UK? <clears throat> clear my throat. The Australian style point based system proposed by Boris Johnson, this um, explains how it works. A point based system is a way of selecting labour migrants based on their characteristics, such as their educational qualifications, language proficiency, word experience, work experience and occupation. Point systems are generally used to select migrants for economic purposes, not for family migrants, refugees or international students. So the emphasis on the word migrant. Um, the best known examples of point systems are from Canada, Australia and New Zealand. Point systems can be designed in many different ways, but key features that have traditionally defined point systems are that the, the applicants are given points for different characteristics and their score on a points test is used to decide whether they can migrate, though it will not be necessarily be the only factor considered. There is some flexibility about how applicants meet the criteria, so a person who has less of one sought after quality e.g. skilled work and experience, can make up for it they, if they have another proficiency, so like language, if they're really good at language, it's like a balancing act, which one is most suitable. Um, the only thing with points-based is it's based on the ages 25 to 33 in Canada, Australia, New Zealand. So there is some kind of age discrimination there. I'm not quite sure how Boris intends to get around that in the UK. Um, some people planning to migrate for employment can qualify for visas without having a job offer lined up in advance. Most countries do not use points-based systems to select work migrants, but instead rely on employer-driven work visa systems. In employer-driven systems, prospective migrants must have a job offer lined up with an employer who is willing to sponsor them. So that's a toughie. Um, however, the gap between employer-driven systems and point-based ones in which migrants can move without a job lined up has narrowed. Over the past decade, as some of the governments using point systems have tried to increase the role of employers, e.g. by prioritising migrants who have job offers. So what they're saying is, is that if you have a job offer first lined up, you're more likely to quali you qualify faster to get, you know, you're more likely to get through quicker. How does the Australian points based system work? The debate about whether the UK should introduce an Australian-style system after Brexit can be confusing because it is not always clear what aspects of Australia's immigration policy are being proposed for the UK. There are many different types of work visas in Australia with different eligibility criteria. The best known the best known points tested vis visa in Australia is known as the Skilled Independent Route, which provides visas for permanent residency. However, variants of the same points test are used in other visas, such as devolved state territory nominated routes. There is also a separate points test for investors and entrepreneurs. No, I didn't know that they would have to do the points based system. How does it work? <clears throat> to 
to apply, prospective migrants first submit an expression of interest online. Some, of, some are then invited to make a visa application if they meet the various basic requirements, e.g. minimum language and age criteria, you see. And if they score highly on the points test summarised in Table 1, which I'll read out later. But, um, so you, they have to be invited, you notice. So they put in an expression of interest. It does, it's not guaranteed that they're going to be invited for an, for an for an interview or to make the reach the second stage. In the skilled independent route, in the skilled independent must earn a minimum of 65 points from the points table below, although in practice candidates often need more points than this to be invited because only the highest ranked candidates are invited to imply to apply. So that is why a few of them are invited because the higher you are on the ranking system, the more likely you are going to be invited to for the points based system. Um, in June 2019, as the migration programme year drew to a close, applicants had to score at least 85 points to be invited up from 70 points six months earlier in December 2018. So they can actually accelerate the points-based system if they want. So one year it could be 65, the next year it could be 85, the next year it could be 105 for all you know. So it would be high, it's a way of them kind of managing who's coming in based on that criteria. Okay, table one, points awarded in the Australian skilled independent point space, and this is based on July 2019. The attribute, age. Now the highest scores for those are aged 25 to 32 years old, and they get a maximum points of 30 points. So that, if you come within that criteria, that gives you 30 points. Language, competency in English, proficiency and superior. So they have three grades. They have the competence, they have the proficiency and they have the superior. And depending on where you grade, you can get up to 20 points for that. Skilled work experience. This is for Australia. So I guess if you parallel this with the UK as I'm talking about it, okay? This is just to give you an idea about the points-based system. The skilled work experience in Australia, more is better, up to eight years. So if you've got up to eight years experience in Australia, and I guess they'd probably bring the equivalent to the UK. So if you have eight years experience in the UK, that's 20 points. I'm not sure if it's still going to be the same, exactly the same because we don't know what they're taking out, what they're putting in. But this is just to give you an idea. Okay, skilled work experience overseas. More is better, up to eight years. So if you're an Indigenous person, like if you're from the UK, but you have eight or more years experience in America or Africa or China, um, that can give you up to 15 points. So you remember, you're looking for up to 85 points. So you've got 30 if you're between 25 and 32. Depending on the proficiency of your language, you get 20 points. If you're skilled in the country that you're in, you, that's another 20 points maximum. And I guess they'll grade it accordingly. And if you've got skilled overseas, that's another 15 points. That's 30, 60, 30, 50, 70. That's 85. For those four, that's already your 85 points. Okay, um, educational, the more the better, you can get up to 20 points for that, educational qualifications. Now, if you've got a PhD, that will give you 20 points. Under that, you know that your, your points will reduce. Um, there's up to five points each for each educational, for each professional training in certain fields. Australian study, certain specialist qualifications and study in regional Australia, qualification in credentialed community language. That's that's really for America. But if you if we want to transfer that information to the UK, you have to assume that okay, if you, the more qualifications you have, will give you five points, five additional points, and you're looking for the highest score. So the more qualifications you have, high level qualifications, the more likely you are to be invited. 
Um, and that source was the Australian Department of Home Affairs points. And it was the t um, skilled dependent visa. OK, so then the Australian government imposes limits on the number of people who will be invited to apply in, in each occupation in order to avoid a small number of occupations dominating the route. So that means if there's only one or two jobs, you may not be pulled in. They kind of do it across the board. They only limit. They limit who they're inviting. Because, you know, like if they've got lots of nurses and that's going to dominate all of their points, they want to make sure that it's evenly distributed. Um, not all work migrants have to pass the points test. For example, there is a different route without a points test for people who have been nominated by an employer. So if an employer has nominated you to come over, according to this, that doesn't mean it's going to apply to the UK you can avoid the points test because that employer is then taking on that responsibility to say that you're competent in whatever they're sponsoring you to do. The UK already has a points test in its immigration system, but it is only used in narrow circumstances. The part of the UK, UK immigration system that is officially known as the points based system is a points system in name only and it's not similar to the Australian one. And something that really was a points-based system conceptually similar to the Australian one used to exist a few years ago, but no longer does. So what are the differences between UK's work visa system and the Australian points-based system? What it would mean, let me show I've got it on the right page. Yeah. What it would mean in practice to adopt an Australian style system in the UK would depend on what aspects of the system were implemented. Some aspects of the Australian immigration system are already quite similar to what happens in the UK. For example, employers can sponsor workers to fill specific vacancies in Australia without passing a points test much as they can in the UK. So that's a bit, like, a bit of repetition there. Some are different. Table three summarizes some key differences between the UK arrangement for admitting skilled workers looking to take up new employee jobs, i.e. under tier two general route, and for more and for more background on UK's work visa system and the range of routes that exist, see the Migration Observatory Briefing. It's called Work Visas and Migrant Workers in the UK. So you need to look at that if you want to know a bit more. Table three. OK, this is key differences between UK tier two and Australians points based CIS visa routes. So in the UK, the role of employers is skilled workers are sponsored by their employers. The employer is responsible for most of the paperwork and the worker must work in the job specified in the application. Detailed requirements are imposed on the employer and the type of work performed, e.g. minimum salary requirements, recruiting procedures. Working, workers themselves must have sufficient English language proficiency, but otherwise it is assumed that employers will recruit people who are qualified to do the work, which is what I said, basically. OK, now for Australia, Australia also has an employer sponsored visa, but its points tested routes do not require employer sponsorship. Candidates can earn points for Australian work experience, which may have been gained while on an employer sponsored visa. The selection process focuses more on the characteristics of the migrant than their future employer. In addition to passing the points test, workers must have skilled assessment to show that, that their qualifications are appropriate to the occupation to the occupation they are planning to practice in. Okay, back to the UK. The system is demand driven in that who is admitted ultimately depends on employers' decisions to hire them. So from the UK, if you haven't got an employer to hire you, 
you might as well forget about the 12 the 12 points based system that's the way i understand it the government imposes criteria that prioritizes some workers over others but employers are still driving recruitment decisions Okay, and as for the Australian, the system is government driven. So the UK is demand driven. Australia, the system is government driven. Migrants express their interest to move to Australia and the government decides which criteria, e.g. language, work, experience, education, matters most. It decides how many workers can come overall and within each occupation and it decides which workers will be invited to make a visa application. The system, it, the system is thus more centrally planned. Okay, the migrant worker status in the UK. I don't know how much I'm going to read of this though, it's quite a lot. I think I might have to leave some of it out. Okay, migrant worker status. Workers are, this is the UK, workers are admitted on temporary visas and must spend at least five years working in the UK before they are eligible to apply for permanent status, indefinite leave to remain. Workers who want to switch jobs must find another employer willing to sponsor them. In, in Australia, workers can receive permanent visas immediately although many do spend time on temporary visas first they are not tied to a specific employer because workers are permanent residents or on a pathway to permanent residence if they come through a provisional visa first they can work in any job including unskilled work if they cannot find skilled work oh australia seems a bit more um, lenient doesn't it and much more flexible. Devolution UK. The same rules apply in the areas of the UK with some minor exceptions such such as separate shortage lists for Scotland and more recently Wales and Northern Ireland. On, um, as far as Australia goes states and territories can nominate workers based criteria they develop themselves. The workers still need to pass a centrally developed points test and visa requirements, although they can score extra points for being nominated by a state or territory and have studied in regional Australia. Okay, in the UK, they've answered my question, there are no age restrictions. The system is designed to fill specific vacancies and the candidate's age is not considered relevant. Whereas in Australia, points tested applicants must be under 45 and the score most and to score most points if they are 25 to 32 inclusive. So in Australia, they're looking for a younger market of migrants. Uh, would an Australian style points based system increase migration to the UK? Australia is a country with relatively higher levels of migration by international standards. The points system has been used over the decades to increase migration above the, the level. That would be achieved by relying only on employer sponsorship. In 2018, 29% of the population of Australia were born abroad compared to an estimated 14% in the UK. This reflects decades of relatively liberal policies towards skilled migrants. So the uh, increase of migration in Australia through this points-based system is 29%, and in the UK it's been 14%, but I guess that's because Australia is quite flexible. However, it is not possible to say whether or how much introducing an Australian style point system to the UK would increase migration without knowing how this system would be designed. A point system is simply a way of ranking and prioritising applicants for work visas. So that's basically what it is in a nutshell. For people who want to come and work in the UK, they're going to have to go through this points-based system. The higher your points, 
the more chance you have of being invited. In principle, it would be possible to implement a restrictive point system that admitted relatively few people or liberal one closer to the model used in Australia. A restrictive point system, for example, might require all workers to be sponsored by employers as well as meeting a points-based skills threshold. A system of this sort exists in Australia, in Austria, for skilled workers in shortage occupation, for example. So thing is, if they're going to make it really strict, that means you're going to have to have an employer who's willing to sponsor you. And a lot of employers don't want the hassle. That is the problem. So if you need an employer for this 12, point, 12 points base system, as well as being over and above the 12 points, qualifying um, over 85 points, then um, that could be a problem. That could be a problem. It's not as easy, you know, they're bandying it around. Oh, 12 point system. Yeah, you can come over, you can come over and work. But if it's based on you having an employer to sponsor you, then that is going to be a problem for a lot of people. Um, what are the advantages and disadvantages of point systems? Debates about the impacts of point systems have focused on one feature in particular, the ability to qualify without an employer sponsor. This has both advantages and disadvantages that are two sides of the same coin. On the one hand, workers entering under the Australian point system are less dependent on their employers and do not need permission to switch between jobs as they do in the UK. As a result, they are expected to have more bargaining power and to operate in a more competitive labour market. So what the UK is also doing, whereas in, Amer in Australia, if you, if you have an employer to sponsor you, you can still go to another job as long as they're willing to sponsor you. There's no problem. In the UK, you can't switch between employers. I guess that's to do with a tracking system. So that's another obstacle that I see. Well, maybe not an obstacle, but a restriction. The most common criticism of the point system is that if workers do not have employment lined up, it is difficult to know whether they are actually employable. The system relies on the government's perception of what skills are valuable rather than on the views of the employers who are to recruit them. Evaluation data from Canada suggested that Highly educated migrant workers selected without a job offer during 2000 were less likely to find skilled work after arrival compared to those selected by employers. As noted above, the government closed the UK's previous Australian style points based system in 2010 to 2011 because of concerns that people it admitted were not finding skilled work. It's kind of, um, it's a two-edged sword really, isn't it? I mean, you can either be leaning and say, okay, you've got the points, you come over and find a job, and then you don't find a job, so you're here with all these points and unemployable. Or you can say, okay, the only way you're going to come over here is to have an employer sponsor you, and at least you've got a job. If you don't like that job, you then have the restriction of or if something doesn't go well or the, the, the dynamics of the job aren't what you expected. You can't just switch. It means going back. So there's a lot of there's a lot at stake, really. However, point systems do not have to admit workers without job offers. It would be possible to require all applicants to have a job offer or only give visas to people who have skilled work experience in the country and thus demonstrated they are employable in the UK. In summary, the impacts of introducing a new point system in the UK would depend crucially on how the system was designed, including questions such as what points were issued for, whether the route was to be for temporary or permanent visas, and whether employer sponsorship would still be required. 
Applicants are assigned points based on a number of professional and personal characteristics with higher points awarded to the most desirable traits. This can range from the amount of time they have worked in the skilled sector, education, level, age and proficiency in the English language. Being a, a competent English speaker is the minimum requirement for someone with superior English and will earn 20 points. Currently, those from within the EU do not need a visa to work in the UK because they benefit from freedom of movement, but that will possibly change after Brexit, depending on what the deal is. Um, for those outside the EU, there are similar similarities to the Australian system. Points are awarded for having English language skills, being sponsored by a company and meeting a salary threshold. So there looks like there's three. Not only does there have to be a salary threshold, that means um, this employer has to give them a certain salary. The, set, the employer has to all be, all, also be read, willing to sponsor them. And then the individual has to be excellent in English in order to qualify. So the maximum number of work visas are awarded. The cap is set about 21,000 a year but is often, isn't often met. So even though they've got 21,000 visas to give out, they don't normally do that. And I think this is in Australia. Madeline Sumption, director of the Migration Observatory at University of Oxford told Reality Check, there is only one way you can get in and that's if you meet all of those criteria. So don't come under the illusion that if you have some but you don't have any you can come into the UK you have to have all and at a very very high level what the UK point system doesn't do is assess the individuals for things like their age and qualifications the UK system trusts trust the employer to decide whether the person is qualified to do the job while the Australian system is more centrally planned um, we also do not have the sort of decentralised system they have in Australia in which different states may try to attract migrants with particular skills. Nicola Sturgeon's Scottish government is keen to introduce this sort of devolution. So like we said before, it's not clear what aspects of the Australian system Mr Johnson is keen to adopt. He says he would ask the MAC that's the Migration Advisory Committee, to look into it. He's also not specified what his policies would be for people wanting to come for other reasons, such as studying on, or wanting to join family members already living in the UK. Current government policy is that after Brexit, skilled workers with a minimum salary of 30,000 will need to be sponsored by an employer. This will... This will be able to bring dependents with them and there will be no cap on their numbers. There would also be a scheme for lower skilled workers to come to the UK but their visas would be limited to 12 months. So okay so you can come on a lower skilled but your visa is going to be restricted to 12 months. Australia uses the PR points calculator 2019 to determine your chances of an Australian skilled visa you are required to score a minimum of 65 points as of April 2019 to qualify but this does not mean you will be selected or invited to apply. Um, the source of this is the visa bureau.com Australia forward slash immigration dash points dash test. So I think we're nearly at an end. Um, yeah, I think we are nearly at an end. So I hope you found that useful. I hope that was a kind of a summary because I know, you know, we hear it all the time, point space, point space, and we're not quite sure what it means. And then you go and look it up and you find lots of technical terms or still don't understand it so I hope the way I've put it over has helped you to understand it better and that's all for now but always don't take my word for it always do your own research always follow up watch videos read newspapers um, go to the source and yeah 
But if you put points-based system in your Google search, you will find the information. So like I said, I'm just giving you an idea about what um, the points-based system is about, just so you have some kind of, so just so you kind of know what to expect, just in case you're thinking about coming over here for the 12, on the 12 point based system. That's all for now. Bye-bye.